Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of Europa Bio, EBE, and FPI, I'm very, very happy to be with you here this evening. Uh, I would like to do two things very briefly in five or six minutes. The first is I would like to highlight in the area of rare cancers a number of innovative collaborations which I believe show more of, um, uh, of a vision towards cooperation between industry, uh, academia, uh, practitioners, and health authorities uh, in trying to overcome obstacles towards efficiency and, and better patient outcomes. I'd like to focus on the area of rare cancers because I believe this is the area where this kind of thinking is perhaps more predominant than in some other areas of medicine. Secondly, and I'm doing a little bit double duty for Richard Sullivan, who couldn't come today, is I'd like to present some research very quickly from 2010, which looks at the sources of funding and the uses of funding for cancer R&D in Europe. So uh, if we start very quickly with the core dilemma, you have different groups within healthcare who historically have looked at the issues within healthcare from their own perspectives. And for the farm industry, we've been troubled by a lot of inflation in R&D and declining productivity and, of course, less products coming to market. Now, what I think creates a common agenda for the different stakeholders involved is a commitment towards patient outcomes and towards efficiency and making therapies available for, for patients in the rare tumors area. Now, one of the questions that was posed before is, is, is one of the problems we face a lack of funds for drug development? Uh, another is, is the research-oriented industry not investing appropriately in R&D? And the third is, what are the issues with public-private partnerships in research and development for drug development? These questions had never been clearly answered before. And in 2009, with the sponsorship of Novartis, the London School of Economics, and Richard Sullivan's organization, the European Cancer Research Managers Foundation, undertook a very significant piece of academic research to, to answer these questions. And amongst the deliverables was the first ever complete bibliographic, uh, excuse me, bibliometric analysis ever done for uh, cancer publications in Europe. So it was a very interesting piece of research, and I'd like to share with you a couple of highlights from that research. I think the first is, uh, it's a fiction that there's not enough money invested in drug development research in Europe. Um, compared to the United States, Europe um, ranks very favorably in terms of indirect funding, in terms of private funding, and also in terms of philanthrop philanthropic funding, with a total of more than 6.5 billion euros per year invested in, in drug development. Uh, this is probably an underestimate. Those figures are from 2007. The only area in which Europe lags behind is in direct public sector funding, and this reflects the very heavy financing given in the United States by the National Institutes of Health and other institutes for basic and transnational research. But um, I think that, that is one assertion that, that it's disproved. The other is in terms of, of cancer research and cancer drug research and development, public-private partnerships are the norm. And this is shown in, in the, the graph which is presented on the screen, where you look at research funding acknowledged on cancer drug publications. Um, I'll circulate these slides, obviously, but what it shows is in the vast majority, there's a very healthy mix between government, public, and independent funding. Now, one area, however, where there is more room to expand is in the area of public-private partnerships, where we lag behind the United States. And I think based on what I've heard today as well, there is an appetite to do more in this area. This is uh, emphasized and reinforced by this graph that you see here. And this is the fourth part of the analysis that was done by Richard Panosin and the other academics involved, where they surveyed leading clinicians about their expectations and desires for the future of, of research in, in Europe. One of the, the areas where um, the results were literally off the scale is consensus that new models and public-private partnerships are needed. Secondly, private sector support for cancer drug development is, is essential, and new models for cancer research and development are needed. Having read through the policy conclusions in detail, some of the things I've heard today about achieving critical mass, reducing fragmentation, better coordination, um, driving networks of excellence, and also simply review, reducing the number of uh, the confusing number of initiatives involved, I think, are all steps in the right direction. Um, I'll skip over this slide, which are the key messages from the, the research that's involved, but I think one of the, the important takeaways is that 
um, with the drug development process. It's not a consecutive process where it starts with academia, then progresses um, to public sector research, and then finally to the private sector for commercialization. They're very complex interactions through the drug development process, which makes it very difficult to abstract any one actor uh, out of this process. Now, to wrap up quite quickly, one of the questions is, what else can we do to create a more efficient system? The answer is there's a great deal which needs to be done, and the pharmaceutical industry needs to be involved as part of it. This is a list of some of the recommendations uh, that we believe is incumbent on the pharmaceutical industry to be a better partner to academia and to clinicians um, in terms of, of um, re reducing the cost and improving efficiency in terms of cancer development. If we look at the clinical trials area in particular, it's an area where we believe in particular for rare ca cancers, there are a number of opportunities to reduce cost and to, um, to significantly expand the remit of clinical trials in Europe. Some of these recommendations are also included in the famous ESMO 39 recommendations from November of 2008, which is part of the Rare Cancers Europe initiative. Um, we've heard, uh, in particular, the example of ContikaNet, um, of a number of uh, collaborative and innovative partnerships in Europe. LeukemiaNet is one of them, which is perhaps not dissimilar from ContikaNet. The second is the Rare Cancers Europe initiative. A third is the, uh, the new partnership for GIST with the European Society of Pathology. Um, next is uh, also the ENETS, the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, and the activities of those groups. But I think we've all seen many examples of such collaborations. And I think, just to wrap up a little bit, where we believe the future lies is, is better, more open, and more holistic collaboration between uh, health authorities, between academia, uh, between researchers, between the, uh, the, the uh, NGO sector, um, and of course, um, pharma and biotech companies. And I think some of the priority areas that we would like to focus on are the issues that I've listed there, uh, namely addressing the opportunities around clinical trials, um, greatly expanding centers of excellence, reference networks, uh, and I, I think in particular the um, uh, the paradigm that the chairman outlined earlier um, in this session is, is very interesting for us as well. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much.